Harry Potter adding first again. Tasha was close. <laughs> she was second. What? How do you do that? You must have a ridiculous good connection. Hey everybody. Hey Abby, Rebecca Funk. Uh, Adriel Underwood, Harry Potter Addicts, one and two. Nicole's Notes, hi, hi, hi. Kendra, hi Kendra. Uh, Julie's Geese, man this music's annoying. Uh, Nicole, Tilly's here, hello, Sarah. Mm, acapella. Uh, I love when authors read their books for the public. Yeah, I wrote this. It's me, John K. Rowling. <laughs> Tis I, the writer. <laughs> okay, I gotta stop this, because... Uh, I don't know, some people love it, but acapella music drives me nuts. <laughs> I'm gonna put on the, the calm music. There we go, there we go. Everything's good now. Okay, everybody, Hi hello, and welcome back to another hour of reading Harry Potter and the Philosopher's Stone. We're getting close to the end. We're not gonna finish tonight, we we me and Mark, who is my trusty Harry Potter advisor. Uh, we calculated how many pages per day we kind of read. Uh, it's approximately 20, and we've got 40 left. So it's gonna be today and tomorrow. So that's when uh, we'll probably finish this book and I will continue on. Uh, for those of you who are just joining, I am reading Harry Potter every day for an hour. I'm enjoying connecting everybody. It's time to take your mind off things, enjoy and laugh. Um, I've never read the books. I've seen two or three movies back in the day. Don't rem remember anything from them. I read all the comments afterwards. So thank you for all the jokes and nice things you write. I really appreciate it and I like connecting to all of you. Uh, no spoilers, please. No hints. Don't even tell me what you think I'm going to be excited for. Uh, and at the end, I have a Q&A where I can interact with you. We can uh, have some conversation and ask questions. Uh, I save all of these on YouTube. Go to the link in my bio to catch up if, you're, if you've missed anything. And uh, I've got them all up there, including the yesterday's. They're all there. Okay, here's a thing. Uh, I asked for uh, different name suggestions, and I think, <laughs> I think uh, I've decided on one that makes me laugh a lot. <laughs> so many people are going to hate. <laughs> uh, okay, I think it was William who had a variation on this, so William C. Vaughn, I think you're the one. Uh, but I'm going to call it The Conk Corner with John Reedsley. So you're welcome for that. <laughs> welcome to the Conk Corner with John Reedsley. <laughs> um, and uh, I'm, I'm debating uh, after this, watching the movie, doing a live stream, but I think it might take away from some of my um, imagination of the voices and the characters. So I don't know, let me hear your opinion, what, whatever you think, if, uh, if I should watch the movie or save them all for later and do that later. Okay, here we go. We uh, are on page 181 of this book, if you want to follow along. Uh, what just happened? Uh, oh yeah, they, they followed Snape and heard Snape and Quirrell uh, talking about trying to break the spell, but they're all deciding not to do anything crazy because they're, uh, they might get kicked out if they get discovered again. Um, okay, here we go. Page 181, top of the book, top of the page. The following morning, notes were delivered to Harry, Hermione, and Neville at the breakfast table. They were all the same. Your detention will, will take place at 11 o'clock tonight. Meet Mr. Filch in the, in the entrance hall. Professor M. McGonagall. Harry had forgotten they still had detentions to do in the, uh, in the fu furor. I don't know that word. Furor over the points they'd lost. He half expected Hermione to complain about this, uh, that this was a whole night of revision lost. But she didn't say a word. Like Harry, she felt they deserved what they got. At 11 o'clock that night, they said goodbye to Ron in the common room and went down to the entrance hall with Neville. Filch was already there, and so was Malfoy. Harry had also forgotten that Malfoy had got de de a detention too. Follow me, said Filch, lighting a lamp and leading them outside. I bet you'll think twice about the breaking of a school rule again, won't you, eh? He said, leering at them. Oh, yes. Hard work and pain are the best teachers, if you ask me. It's just a pity they let the old punishments die out. Hang you by your wrists, 
from the ceiling for a few days. <laughs> I've got the chains still in my office. Keep them well oiled in case they're ever needed. <laughs> right, off we go. And don't think of running off. Now it'll be worth f for you if you do. That, that works, I guess. They marched off across the dark grounds. Nef Neville kept sniffing. Harry wondered what their punishment was going to be. It must be something really horrible, or Filch wouldn't be sounding so delighted. The moon was bright, but clouds scudding across it kept th uh, throwing them into darkness. Ahead, Harry could see the lighted windows of Hagrid's hut. Then they heard a distant shout. Is that you, Filch? Hurry up! I want to get started! Harry's heart rose. If they were going to be working with Hagrid, it wouldn't be so, ba so bad. His relief must have showed in his face, because Filch said, I suppose you think you'll be enjoying yourself with that oaf. Well, think again, boy. It's into the forest you're going, and I'm much mistaken if you'll all come out in one piece. At this, Neville let out a little moan, and Malfoy stopped dead in his tracks. The forest, he repeated, and he didn't sound quite as cool as usual. We can't go in there at night. There's all sorts of things in there. Werewolves, I heard. Come up here, buddy. Uh, where was I? Neville clutched the sleeve of Harry's robe and made a choking sound. That's your lookout, isn't it? Said Filch, his voice cracking with glee. Should have thought of them werewolves before you got in trouble, shouldn't you? Hagrid came striding towards them out of the dark, fang at his heel. He was carrying his large crossbow, and a quiver of arrows hung over his shoulder. About time, he said. I've been waiting for half an hour already. All right, Harry, Hermione. I shouldn't be too friendly. Um, I shouldn't be too friendly to them, Hagrid, said F uh, Filch coldly. They're here to be punished, after all. That's why you're late, is it? said Hagrid, frowning at Filch. Been lecturing them, eh? It's not your place to do that. You've done your bit. I'll take it from here. I'll be back at dawn, said Filch, for what's left of them, he added nastily, and he turned and started back towards the castle, his lamp bobbing away in the darkness. Malfoy now turned to Hagrid. I'm not going in that forest, he said, and Harry was pleased to hear the note of panic in his voice. You are, if you want to stay at Hogwarts, said Hagrid fiercely. You've done wrong, and now you've got to pay for it. But this servant stuff, it's not for students to do. I thought we'd, we'd be writing lines or something. If my father knew I was doing this, he'd tell you that's how it is at Hogwarts, Hagrid growled. Writing lines? What, what good's that to anyone? You'll do something useful and you'll get out. If you think your father rather you were expelled, then get back off to the castle and pack. Go on. Malfoy didn't move. He looked at Hagrid furiously, but then dropped his gaze. Right then, said Hagrid. Now, listen carefully, because it's dangerous what we're going to do tonight. And I don't want no one taking risks. Follow me over here for a moment. He led them to the very edge of the forest. Holding his lamp up high, he pointed down a narrow, winding earth track that disappeared into the thick black trees. A light breeze lifted their hair as he looked into the forest. Look there said Hagrid. See that stuff shining on the ground? Silvery stuff. That's unicorn blood. There's a unicorn in there, been hurt badly by some man. This is the second time in a week. I found, uh, I found one dead last Wednesday. We're gonna try and find the poor thing. We might have to put it out of its misery. And what if, and what if whatever hurt the unicorn finds us first, said Malfoy, unable to keep the fear out of his voice. Gonna work on Malfoy. There's nothing that lives in the forest that will hurt you if, if you're with me or Fang, said Hagrid, and keep to your path. Right now, we're gonna split into, into two parties and follow the trial in, a trial in different directions. There's blood all over the place. It must have been staggering around since last night at least. I want Fang, said Malfoy quickly, looking at Fang's long teeth. All right, but I warn you, he's a coward, said Hagrid. So me, Harry, and Hermione, Hermione will go one way and Draco, Neville, and Fang will go the other. Now, if any of us finds a unicorn, we'll send up green sparks, right? Get your wands out and practice now. That's it. And if anyone gets in trouble, send up red sparks and we'll come all and find you. 
So be careful. Let's go. So they're being punished to go and try and help a unicorn and maybe get killed? <laughs> what kind of school is this? <laughs> this is child abuse. <laughs> this school is full of child abusers. Okay, sorry to break the magic for some of you, but it's true. The forest was black and silent. A little way into it, they reached a fork in the earth path, and Harry, Hermione, and Hagrid took the, took the left path, while Malfoy, Neville, and Fang took the right. They walked in silence, their eyes on the ground. Why? Why would you be looking at the ground? Every now and then, a ray of moonlight through the branches above lit a spot of silver, silver blue blood. Okay, that makes sense. <laughs> on the fallen leaves. <laughs> I'm still be like, nah, oh just walking through the forest. <laughs> Uh, where am I? Harry saw that Hagrid looked very worried. Could a werewolf be killing the unicorns? Harry asked. Not fast enough, said Hagrid. It's not easy to catch a unicorn. They're powerful magic creatures. I never knew one to be hurt before. They walked past a mossy tree stump. Harry could hear running water. Running water. There must be a, there must be a stream somewhere close by. There were still spots of unicorn blood here. And there, along the winding path... Sorry, I just thought of Conk's Corner. It made me laugh again. <laughs> You're right, Hermione, Hagrid whispered. Don't worry. It can't have gone, to, uh, gone far if this... Sorry. Don't worry. It can't, it can't have gone far if it's this badly hurt. And then we'll be able to... Get behind that tree! Hagrid seized Harry and Hermione and hoisted them off the path beho behind a towering oak. He pulled out an arrow and fitted it into his crossbow, raising it, ready to fire. The three of them listened. Something was slithering over dead leaves nearby. It sounded like a cloak trailing along the ground. Hagrid was squinting up the dark path. But after a few seconds, the sound faded away. I knew it, he, mur he murmured. There's a, there's a somewhat in there. No, there's, a, there's somewhat in here that shouldn't be. A werewolf, Harry suggested. That wasn't no werewolf, and it wasn't no unicorn neither, said Hagrid grimly. Right, follow me, but careful. Now, they walked more slowly, ears straining for the, for the faintest sound. Suddenly, in a clearing ahead, something definitely moved. Who's there? Hagrid called. Show yourself. I'm armed. And into the clearing came, was it a man or a horse? To the waist, a man with red hair and beard, but, but below that was a horse's gleaming chestnut body with a long reddish tail. Harry and Hermione's jaws dropped. Oh. Okay. Oh, it's you, Ronan. Oh. <laughs> oh. Oh, it's just you. I just love everything so normal to these people. Does anything ever surprise them? <laughs> Except for money? <laughs> Ron's like, what's money? That's weird. But I guess this... Uh... <laughs> oh, it's you, Ronan, said Hagrid in relief. How are you? He walked forward and shook the centaur's hand. Adjectives for the centaur, please. Uh, does he pop around often? Not really? Where's centaur? Uh, what, what is it? Very horse-like, very warrior-like. Yeah. Uh, British? Yeah, why not? Uh, or, or he, uh, uh, sure. <laughs> Good evening to you, Hagrid, said Ronan. He had a deep, sorrowful voice. Okay, a deep, sorrowful voice. I could have read ahead. Good evening to you, Hagrid, said Ronan. He had a deep, sorrowful voice. Were you going to shoot me? Can't be too careful, Ronan, said Hagrid. Calm and wise. Okay, well spoken, said Hagrid, patting his, his crossbow. There's somewhat bad looseness, Forrest. This is Harry Potter and Hermione Granger, by the way. Students up at the school. And this is Ronan, you two. He's a centaur. We no we'd noticed, said Hermione faintly. Good evening, said Ronan. Students, are you? And do you learn much up at that school? Um, a bit, said Hermione timidly. A bit. Well, that's something, Roman sighed. Uh, ancient lol, you're w awesome at this on the spot. Oh, thank you very much. He flung back his head and stared at the sky. <laughs> <laughs> okay. <laughs> flung up his head is a bit over-exaggerated, but okay. 
Maz is bright tonight. Yeah, said Hagrid. Yeah, said Hagrid, glancing up too. Listen, I'm glad we've run into you, Ronan, because there's a bit of you, there's a unicorn been hurt. You seen anything? Ronan didn't answer immediately. He stared unblinkingly upwards, then sighed again. Always the innocent are the first victims, he said. So it has been for ages past. So it is now. Yeah, said Hagrid. But have you seen anything, Ronan? Anything unusual? Mars is bright tonight, Ronan re repeated while Hagrid watched him impatiently. Unusually bright. Yeah, but I was meaning anything unusual a bit nearer home, said Hagrid. So you haven't noticed, noticed anything strange? Yet again, Ronan took a while to answer. At last he said, The forest hides many secrets. A movement in the tree behind Ronan made Hagrid raise his bow again. But it was only a second centaur, black-haired and bodied a wilder looking a wilder looking than Ronan. Okay, another voice. Okay, that's Hello, Bane, said Hagrid. Alright. Uh, Bane a bit rougher. Good evening, Hagrid. I hope you are well. Well enough. Look, I've just been asking Ronan. You seen anything odd in here lately? Only there's only there's a unicorn been injured. Would you know anything about it? Bane walked over to stand next to Ronan. He looked skywards. Mars is bright tonight, <laughs> he said simply. <laughs> these guys are oddballs. I, I thought they were going to be like these awesome <laughs> dudes. They're just like, they're, they're like high on, on, on forest mushrooms, basically. <laughs> they're, they're hippies. <laughs> they're like, there's something's in danger, something's happening. They're like, whoa, Mars. <laughs> Okay, Harry and Hermione... Oh, wait, okay, but sorry. Um, We've heard, said Hagrid grumpily. Well, if all of you do see anything, let me know, won't you? We'll be off then. Hermione, Her Her Harry and Hermione followed him out of the clearing, staring over their shoulders at Ronan and Bane, until the trees blocked their view. Never, said Hagrid irritably, try and get a straight answer, answer out of a centaur. Ruddy stargazers, not interested in anything closer to the moon. Are there are there many of them in are there many of them in here? Oh, a fair few. Keep themselves themselves to themselves mostly, but they're good enough about turning up if ever I want a word. They're deep mind centers. They know things. Just don't let on too much. Do you think there was a centaur we heard earlier? Said Harry. Did, did that sound like hooves to you? Nah. If you ask me, what was uh, that? That was what's been killing the centaurs. Never heard anything like it before. They just really like Mars. Stop the shaming. Yeah, I bet they do. They walked on through the dense, dark trees. Harry kept looking nervously over his shoulder. He had the nasty feeling they were being watched. He was very glad they had Hagrid and his crossbow with them. They had just passed a bend in the path when Hermione grabbed Hagrid's arm. Hagrid, look! Red sparks! The others are in trouble! You two wait here! Hagrid shouted. Stay on the path! I'll come back for you! They heard him crashing away through the undergrowth and stood looking at each other, very scared, until they couldn't hear anything but the rustling of leaves around them. Oh boy, kids alone in the forest. You don't think they've been hurt, do you? Whispered Hermione. I don't care if Malfoy has, but if something's got Neville, it's our own, our own fault he's here in the first place. The minutes dragged by. Their ears seemed sharper than usual. Harry seemed to be picking up every sigh of the wind, every cracking twig. What was going on? Where were the others? At last, a great crunching noise, noise announced Hagrid's return. Malfoy, Neville, and Fang. Come on, come on, boy. Come here. <laughs> he can't get up. You want to help him up? <laughs> this is too much stuff around here. He's, uh, okay. At last, a great crunching noise announced Hagrid's return. Malfoy, Nef Neville, and Fang were with him. Hagrid was fuming. Malfoy, it seemed, had sneaked up behind Neville and grabbed him for a joke. That idiot. Neville had panicked and sent up the sparks. We'll be lucky to catch anything now. We'll be lucky to catch anything now with the, with the racket you two are making. Right, we're changing groups. Neville, you stay with me and Hermione. Harry, you go with Fang and this idiot. <laughs> I'm sorry. I'm sorry, Hagrid added in a whisper to Harry. But, but, but he'll have a harder time frightening you. And we've got to get this done. So Harry set off into the heart of the forest with Malfoy and Fang. They walked for nearly half an hour, deeper and deeper into the forest, until a path 
became almost impossible to follow because the trees were so thick. Harry thought the blood seemed to be getting thicker. There were splashes on the roots of, the, of a tree, as though the poor creature had been thrashing around in, in pain close by. Harry could see a clearing ahead through the tangled branches of an ancient oak. Look, he murmured, holding out his arm to stop Malfoy. Something bright white was gleaming on the ground. They inched closer. It was the unicorn, all right, and it was dead. Oh. Harry had never seen anything so beautiful and sad. Its long, slender legs were stuck out at odd angles where it had fallen, and its mane was spread pearly white on the dark leaves. Harry had taken one step towards it when a slithering sound made him freeze where he stood. A bush on the edge of the clearing quivered. Then, out of the shadows, a hooded figure came crawling across the ground like some stalking beast. Harry, Malfoy, and Fang stood transfixed. The cloaked figure reached the unicorn. It lowered its head over the wound in the animal's side and began to drink its blood. Ah! <laughs> Malfoy let out, let out a terrible scream and bolted. So did Fang. That scream was horrible because his is horrible, okay? <laughs> The, the uh, 20 bucks for what? The hooded figure raised its head and looked right at Harry. Unicorn blood was dribbling down its front. It got, it got to its feet and came swiftly towards him. He couldn't move for fear. Then a pain pierced his side like he'd never felt before. Oh, snap. It was as though his scar was on fire. Half blinded, he staggered backwards. His, he heard hooves behind him galloping and something jumped clean over him, charging at the figure. The pain in Harry's head was so bad, he fell to his knees. It took a minute or two to pass. When he looked up, the figure had gone. A centaur was standing over him, not Ronan or Bane. This one looked younger. He had white, blonde hair and a palomino body. Okay, another one. Are you all right? said the centaur, pulling Harry to his feet. Yes, thank you. Yes, thank you. What was that? The centaur didn't answer. He had astonishing blue eyes like pale sapphires. He looked carefully at Harry, his eyes lingering on the scar which stood out, livid, on Harry's forehead, and then they kissed. <laughs> <laughs> Got you again! Got your cock! Okay. <laughs> uh, you, you, you are the Potter boy, he said. You had better get back to Hagrid. The forest is not safe at this time, especially for you. Can you ride? It will be quicker this way. My name is Firenze. Okay, this, is this an Italian centaur? My name is Firenze, he added as he lowered himself onto, the, onto his front legs so that Harry could clamber onto his back. Uh, there, was a sudden, there was suddenly a sound of more galloping from the other side of the clearing. Ronan and Bane came bursting through the trees, their flanks heaving and sweaty. Um, Bane, oh, that's the gruffer word. Firenze, Bane thundered. What are you doing? You have a human on your back. Have you no shame? Are you a common mule? Do you realize who, do you realize who this is? Said Firenze. <laughs> this is the potter boy. The quicker he leaves this forest, the better. <laughs> what have you been telling him? Growled Bane. Remember, Firenze, we are sworn not to set ourselves against the heavens. Have you not read what is to come in the movements of the planets? Okay, I'm so tempted to make them all Italian, but the challenge will be to read them Italian and still make it, like, truthful and, and you know, to what's going on, so I'm not going to do that. I'm just going to stick with the one guy. Yes. <laughs> Ronan pawed, pawed the ground nervously. Ronan. Uh, that's the first guy. I'm sure Firenze thought he was acting for the best, he said in his gloomy voice. Bane kicked his back, legs in anger. For the best. What is it What is it that to do with us? Centaurs are concerned with what has been foretold. It is not our business to run around like donkeys after stray humans in our forest. Firenze suddenly reared on to his hind legs in anger so that Harry had to grab his shoulders to stay on. Do you not see that a unicorn... <laughs> Okay, I'm not going to do it. <laughs> okay, I'm going to stick to where it's at. Okay, I'm sorry. <laughs> okay. Do you not see that unicorn? Firenze bellowed at Wet Bane. Do you not understand why it was killed? 
or have the planets not let you in on that secret? I set myself against what is lurking in this forest. Bane, yes, with humans alongside me if I must. And Ferenzi whisked around, with Harry clutching on as best he could. They plunged off into the trees, leaving Ronan and Bane behind them. Harry didn't have a clue what was going on. <laughs> Why is Bane so angry, he asked. What was that thing you saved me from, anyway? Ferenzi slowed to walk, warned Harry to keep his head bowed in case of low-hanging branches, but did not answer Harry's question. Keep it? I, su I should keep... <laughs> I should keep the Italian? Okay, I'm going to keep it Italian. You let me know, and you, you tell me. You let me know if you want all of them to be Italian, okay? You let me know, and you tell me if they say yes or no. <laughs> Harry didn't have a clue what was... Oh, okay. Ferenzi slowed to a walk, warned Harry to keep his head bowed in case of low-hanging branches, but did not answer Harry's question. They made their way through the trees in silence for so long that Harry thought Ferenzi would, didn't want to talk to him anymore. They were passing through a particularly dense patch of trees, however, when Ferenzi su suddenly stopped. Harry Potter, do you know what unicorn of blood is used for? No, said Harry, startled by the odd question. We've only used the horn and tail hair and, po and potions. That is because it is a monstrous thing to slay a unicorn, said Ferenzi. On only one who has nothing to lose and everything to gain would commit such a crime. The blood of a unicorn will keep you alive even if you are an inch from death, but at a terrible price. You have slain something, something pure and defenseless to save yourself, and you will have but a half-life, a cursed life, from the moment the blood touch your lips. New York Italian for Bane. Ho, ho, ho! Harry stared at the back of Ferenzi's head, which was dappled silver in the moonlight. But who'd be, who, but who'd be that desperate, he wondered aloud. If you're going to be cursed forever, forever, death's better, isn't it? It is, Ferenzi agreed. Unless, you, unless all you need is to stay alive long enough to drink something else. Something that will bring you back to full strength and power. Something that will mean you can never die. Mr. Potter, do you know what is hidden in the school at this, at this very moment? The Philosopher's Stone, of course. The elixir of life, but I don't understand. Who can you think of nobody who has awaited the many years to return to power, who has clung to life, awaiting their chance? It was as though an iron fist had clenched some suddenly around Harry's heart. Over the rustling of trees, he seemed to hear once more what Hagrid had told him on the night they had met. Some say he died. Cod swallow, in my opinion. Don't know if he don't know if he had enough human left in him to die. Do you mean Harry croaked. That was Vol... Um, Harry! Harry, are you all right? Um, Hermione was running towards, towards them down the path, Hagrid puffing alongside her. I'm fine, said Harry, hardly knowing what he was saying. The unicorn's dead, Hagrid. It's in that clearing back there. This is where I leave you. For, um, this is where I leave you. Uh, Fr Firenze m m murmured as Hagrid hurried off to examine the unicorn. You are safe for now. <laughs> Harry slid off his back. Good luck, Harry Potter, said Firenze. The planets have been read, the, the planets have been read the lo wrongly before now, even by centaurs. I hope this, uh, this is uh, one of those times. <laughs> I'm sorry. I've taken this beautiful creature, this beautiful person. <laughs> I put a really bad Italian accent on it, <laughs> where all I do is just add E's all over the place. <laughs> oh, man. He turned and cantered back into the depths of the forest, leaving Harry shivering behind him. <laughs> I've ruined that character. I realize that, okay? Uh, Ron had fallen asleep in the dark common room, waiting for them to return. He shouted something about Quidditch fouls when Harry roughly shook him awake. <laughs> He's just dreaming of Quidditch fouls. Oh, that's great. I like that. Um, in a matter of seconds, though, he was wide-eyed wide as Harry began to tell him and Hermione what had happened in the forest. Harry couldn't sit down. Oh, I'm sorry. Oh, I couldn't. There we go. Harry couldn't sit down. He paced up and down in front of the fire. He was still shaking. Snape wants the stone for Voldemort, and Voldemort's waiting in the forest. 
And all this time we thought Snape just wanted to get rich. Stop saying the name, said Ron in a... Stop saying the name, said Ron in a terrified whisper, as if he thought Voldemort could hear him. Harry wasn't listening. Ferenzi saved me, but he shouldn't have done. Bane was furious. He was talking about interfering with what the planets say is going to happen. They must show that Voldemort's coming back. Bane thinks Ferenzi should have let Voldemort kill me. I suppose that's written in the stars as well. Will you stop saying the name? Ron hissed. So all I've got to wait for now is Snape to steal the stone, Harry went on feverishly. Then Voldemort will be able to come and finish me off. Well, I suppose Bane will be happy. Hermione looked very frightened, but she had a word of comfort. Harry, everyone says Dumbledore's the only one you know who was ever afraid of. With Dumbledore around, you know who won't touch you. Anyway, who says the centaurs are, are right? It sounds like fortune telling to me. And Professor McGonagall, M McGonagall says that's a very imprecise branch of magic. The sky had turned light before they stopped talking. They went to bed exhausted, their throats sore. But the night's surprises weren't over. When Harry pulled back his sheets, he found his in invisibility cloak folded neatly underneath him. There was a note pinned to it, just in case. Woo, boy, things are taking off. Also, she is throwing so many different things in there. Ghosts, unicorns, uh, three-headed dog from, um, from uh, Greek mythology. I'm just thinking, in all these other books, what is she, like, how, what is she going to come up with? That's what I'm thinking is like, oh, wow, they, she's got a crap ton, of, crap ton of things in here. I'm all for this Italian representation. Okay, cool. I'm going to keep it. It seems like the majority is <laughs> favors Italian. Uh, but he's into it. Uh, and for, for the others, too? Uh, uh, what do you, uh, yeah, for the others. <laughs> okay, from now on. <laughs> it was like seven or nine votes to five or six. Oh, man. Okay, sorry. I'm going to go with the majority. I'm going to go with the majority. From now on, centaurs are Italian. New York Italian, Italian Italian, whatever bad accent I'm going to do. I'm sorry. <laughs> Chapter 16. Through the trapdoor. In years to come, Harry would never quite remember how he managed to get through his exams when he half expected Voldemort to come bursting through the door at any moment. Yet the days crept by, and there could be no doubt that Fluffy was still alive and well behind the locked door. It was sweltering hot, especially in the large classroom where they did their written papers. They had been given special new quills for the exams, which had been bewitched with an anti-cheating spell. They had, practically, they, they had practical exams as well. Professor Flitwick, Flitwick called them one by one into his class to see if they could make a pineapple da dance across a desk. Professor McGonagall watched them turn a mouse into a snuff box. Points were given for how pretty the snuff box was but taken away if it had whiskers. Snape made them, made them all nervous, breathing down their necks while they tried to remember how to make a forget me potion. So this is a question that probably popped up a bunch of times on Harry Potter forums or something like that back in the 90s. I think it's came, this came out in the 90s, right? These books, they came out in the 90s, right? But if animals get turned into like something like a snuff box, are they killed and then a snuff box? Or uh, are they living as a snuff box? Or are they simply, do they simply become the snuff box? Three different options, let me know. Harry did the best he could, trying to ignore the stabbing pains in his forehead, which had been bothering him ever since his trip into the forest. Neville thought Harry had a bad case of exam nerves because Harry couldn't sleep. But the truth was that Harry kept being woken, woken up by his old nightmare, except that it was now worse than ever because there was a hooded figure dripping blood in it. Ugh, that's horrible. Maybe it was because they hadn't seen what Harry had seen in the forest, or because they didn't have scars burning on their foreheads. But Ron and Hermione didn't seem as worried about the stone as Harry. The idea of Voldemort certainly scared them, but he didn't keep visiting them in dreams, and they were so busy with their revisions they didn't have much time to fret about what Snape or anyone else might be up to. He does not shave his beard at the end of this book. He's, this is an 11-year-old kid, maybe 12 now. I don't know when his birthday is. <laughs> Their very last exam was History of Magic, one hour of answering questions about batty old wizards who'd invented self-stirring cauldrons, and they'd be free, free for a whole wonderful week until their exam results came out. When the, when the ghost of, of Professor Binns told them to put down their quills and roll up their parchment, Harry couldn't help cheering with the rest. Ha ha ha! Yay! Ha 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 ha! ha. 
That was far easier than I thought it, it would be, said Hermione, as they joined the crowds flocking out into the sunny grounds. I didn't, I needn't have learnt all, uh, I, I needn't have learnt about the 1,637 werewolf code of conduct, or the uprising of Elf, Elfric the Eager. For sure, fan fiction about Elfric the Eager somewhere. Uh, okay, sorry. Hermione always liked to go through their exam papers afterwards, but Ron said this made him feel ill. Feel, feel Ill. So they wandered down to the lake and flopped under a tree. The Weasley twins and Lee Jordan were ticking, tickling the tentacles of a giant squid, which was ba basking in the warm shallows. <laughs> that is bizarre. That is very bizarre. The Weasley... Why? Is it okay? And is this giant squid like uh, has a character? It's like, ha ha ha. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. Uh, no more revision, Ron sighed happily, stretching out onto the grass. You could look more cheerful, Harry. We've got a week bef before we find out how badly we've done. There's no need to worry yet. Harry was rubbing his forehead. I wish I knew what this means, he burst out angrily. My scar keeps hurting. It's happened before, but never as often as this. Go to Madame Pumphrey, Hermione suggested. I'm not ill, said Harry. I think it's a warning. It means danger's coming. Ron couldn't get worked up. It was too hot. <laughs> Harry, relax. Hermione's right. The stone safe's as long, safe as long as Dumbledore's around. Anyway, we've never heard any proof Snape found out how to get past Fluffy. He nearly had his leg ripped off once. He's not going to try that again in a hurry. And Neville will play Quidditch for, for England before Hagrid lets Dumbledore down. Oh, Reuben, it's the only time I want to listen to you. Harry, Harry nodded, but he couldn't shake off a lurking feeling that there was something he'd forgotten to do, something important. When he tried to explain this, Hermione said, That's just the exams. I woke up last night and was halfway through my transfiguration notes before I, I remembered we'd done that one. We, we'd done that one. Harry was quite sure the unsettled feeling didn't have anything to do with work, though. He watched an owl flutter toward the school across the bright blue sky, a note clamped in its mouth. Hagrid was the only one who ever sent him letters. Hagrid would never betray Dumbledore. Hagrid would never tell anyone how to get past, past Fluffy. Never. But Harry suddenly jumped to his feet. Where are you going? said Ron sleepily. I've just thought of something, said Harry. He had gone white. We've got to go and see Hagrid. Now. Why? Painted Hermione, hurrying to keep up. Don't you think it's a bit odd, said Harry, scrambling up the grassy slope, that what Hagrid wants more than anything else is a dragon, and a stranger turns up who just happens to have an egg in his pocket. How many, how many people wander around with dragon eggs if it's against wizard law? Luckily they found Hagrid, don't you think? Why didn't I see it before? What are you on about? said Ron. But Harry, sprinting across the grounds toward the forest, didn't answer. Okay, I'm just seeing Tim, no spoilers. Did Tim give a spoiler? Please tell me that there's no spoiler in there. Um, Hagrid was sitting in an armchair outside his house. His trousers and sleeve, sleeves were rolled up and he was shelling peas into a large bowl. Hello, he said, smiling. Finished your exams? Got time for a drink? Yes, please, said Ron, but Harry cut across him. No, we're in a hurry, Hagrid. I've got to ask you something. You know that night you won Norbert? Norbert? What did the stranger you were playing cards with look like? Dunno, said Harry, Harry casually. He wouldn't take his cloak off. He saw the three of them looking stunned and raised his eyebrows. Okay, was that Voldemort in the forest eating, eating that unicorn? Oh, I bet it was. Thanks for not revealing that with your eyes. He looked at me very blankly. He went... <laughs> nice. Okay. Um, did he give a spoiler? Was there a spoiler? Uh, no. Okay, thank you, Tim. Thank you, Tash, for watching out. He saw the three of them looking stunned and raised his eyebrows. It's not that unusual. You get a lot of funny folk in the hog hogshead. That's the pub down in the village. Might have, might have been a dragon dealer, mightn't he? I never saw his face. He kept his hood up. Harry sunk down next to the bowl of peas. What did you talk to him about, Hagrid? Did you mention ho uh, Hogwarts at all? At all? Might have come up, said Hagrid, frowning as he tried to remember. Yeah. He asked what I did. And I told him I was a gamekeeper here. He asked a bit about that sort of creatures I look after. So I told him, and I said what I'd always really wanted was a dragon. And then, I, 
I can remember too well because he kept buying me drinks. Let's see. Uh, yeah. Then he said he had the dragon egg and we could play cards for it if I wanted. But he had to be sure I could handle it. He didn't want it to get to any old home. So I told him, after Fluffy, a dragon would be easy. And did he... Did he seem interested in Fluffy? Harry asked, trying to keep his voice calm. Well, yeah. How many three-headed dogs do you meet? Even around Hogwarts. So I told him, Fluffy's a piece of cake if you know how to calm him down. Just play, play him a bit of mu music. Just play him a bit of music. And he'll go straight off to sleep. Harry Hagrid suddenly looked horrified. I shouldn't have told you that, he blurted out. For forget I said it. For forget I said it. Hey, where are you going? Hagrid, Harry, Ron, and Hermione didn't speak to each other at all until they came to a halt in the entrance hall, which seemed very cold and gloomy after the grounds. We've got to get to Dumbledore, said Harry. Hag Hagrid told the stranger how to get past Fluffy, and it was either Snape or Voldemort un un under that cloak. It must have been easy once he, got, once he got Hagrid drunk. I just hope Dumbledore believes us. Firenze might back us up if Bane didn't stop him. It doesn't stop him. Where's Dumbledore's office? They looked around, as if hoping, hoping to see a sign pointing them in the right direction. They had never been told where Dumbledore lived, nor did they know anyone who had been sent to see him. We'll just have to... Harry began, but a voice suddenly rang across the hall. What are you doing? What are you three doing inside? It was Professor McGonagall, carrying a large pile of books. We want to see Professor, Professor Dumbledore, said Hermione, rather brave. We want to see Professor Dumbledore, said Hermione, rather bravely. Harry and Ron, Harry and Ron thought. See Professor Dumbledore. Professor McGonagall, uh, Professor McGonagall repeated, as though this was a very fishy thing to want to do. Why? Harry swallowed. Now what? It's sort of a secret, he said, but he wished at once he hadn't, because Professor McGonagall, McGonagall's nostrils flared. flared. Professor Mc Dumbledore left ten minutes ago, she said coldly. He received an urgent owl from the Mi Ministry of Magic and flew off for London at once. He's gone, said Harry frantically. Now, Professor Dumbledore is a very great wizard, Potter. He has many demands on his time. But this is important. But, but this is important. Something you have to say is more important than the Ministry of Magic, Potter. Look, said Harry, throwing caution to the winds. Professor... Professor, it's about the Philosopher's Stone. Mrs. Doubtfire, yeah, I, I can't get away from it. I'm sorry. I don't know how... If you have a suggestion how to change the voice, let me know. I'm, that's what it is right now. Whatever Professor McGonagall had expected, it wasn't that. The book she was carrying tumbled out of her arms, but she didn't pick them up. How do you know? She sputtered. Professor, I think... I know that... That someone's going to try and steal the stone. I've got to talk to Professor Dumbledore. She eyed him with a mixture of shock and suspicion. Professor, Dumbl Professor Dumbledore will be back tomorrow, she said finally. I don't know how you found out about the stone, but rest assured, no one can possibly steal it. It's too well protected. P Professor Potter, I know what I'm talking about, she said shortly. She bent down and gathered up, gathered up the fallen books. I suggest you all go back outside and enjoy the sunshine. But they didn't. It's tonight, said Harry, once he's sure Professor McGonagall was out of earshot. Uh, Sna Snape's going through the trapdoor tonight. He's found out everything he needs, and now he's got Dumbledore out of the way. He sent that note. I bet the Ministry of Magic will get a real shock when Dumbledore turns up. Uh, but what can we... Hermione gasped. Harry and Ron wheeled around. Snape was standing there. Good afternoon, he said smoothly. They stared at him. You shouldn't be inside on a day like this, he said, with an odd, twisted smile. We were, Harry began, without any idea what, was going, what he was going to say. You want to be more careful, said Snape, hanging around like this. People will think you're up to something, and Gryffindor really can't afford to lose any more points, can they? Harry flushed. They turned to go back outside, but Snape called them back. Be warned, Potter. Any more nighttime wanderings, and I will personally make sure you are expelled. Good day to you. He strode off in the direction of the staff room. Out on the stone steps, Harry turned to the others. Snoop! I'm sorry, Snoop. McGonagall should be a bit more shrill. 
Okay. Right, here, here's what we're going to do, he whispered urgently. One of, oh, how many left? Oh, this is all one chapter, I think. Oh, it is one chapter, so we're gonna just stop at some point, okay. Right, here's what we're going to do, he whispered urgently. One of us has got to keep an eye out on Snape. Wait outside the staff room and follow, follow him if he leaves it. Hermione, you'd better do that. Why me? It's, it's obvious, said Ron. You can pretend to be waiting for Professor Flitwick, you know, he put on a high voice. Oh, oh, Professor Flitwick, I'm so worried. I think I got a question 14B wrong. Oh, shut up, said Hermione. But she agreed to go and wash out for Snape. And we'd better stay outside the third floor corridor. Oh, no. And we'd better stay outside the third floor corridor, Harry told Ron. Come on. But that part of the plan didn't work. No sooner had they reached the doors separating Fluffy from the rest of the school than Professor McGonagall turned up again. And this time, she lost her temper. I suppose you think... <laughs> I'm not going to be too shrill. I suppose you think you're harder to get past than a pack of enchantments. Enchantments, she stormed. Enough of this nonsense. If I hear you've, you've come anywhere near here again, I'll take another 50 points from Gryffindor. Yes, Weasley, from my own house. Harry and Ron went back to the common room. Harry had just said, at least Hermione's on Snape's tail, when the portrait of the fat lady swung open and Hermione came in. I'm sorry, Harry, she wailed. Sna Snoop came out and asked me about what I was doing, so I said I was waiting for Flitwick, and Snape went to get him, and I've only just got away. I don't know where Snape went. Well, that's it then, isn't it? Harry said. The other two stared at him. He was pale, and his eyes were glittering. Glittering? Seems into this. Uh, okay. Uh, his eyes were glittering. I'm going out of here tonight, and I'm going to try and get the stone first. You're mad, said Ron. You can't, said Hermione. After what McGonagall and Snape, Snape said, you'll be expelled. So what, Harry shouted. Don't you understand? If Snape gets hold of that stone, Voldemort's coming back. Haven't you heard what it was like when he was trying to take over? There won't be any Hogwarts to get expelled from. He'll flatten it or turn it into a school for dark arts. Losing points doesn't matter anymore. Can't you see? Do you think he'll leave? He'll leave you and your families alone if Gryffindor wins a house cup. If I get caught before I can get to the stone, well, I'll have to go back to the Dursleys and wait for Voldemort to find me there. It's only dying a bit later than, uh, than, I, would have, than I would have done because I'm never going over to the dark side. I'm going through that trapdoor tonight, and nothing you two say can stop me. Voldemort killed my parents, remember? Ooh, Harry. He, glare, he glared at them. You're right, Harry, said Hermione in a small voice. I'll use the invisibility cloak, said Harry. It's just lucky I got, I got it back. But will it cover all three of us, said Ron. All, all three of us? Oh, come off it. You don't think we'd let you go alone? Of course not, said Hermione briskly. How do you think you'd get, this, get to the stone without us? I'd better go and look through my books. There might be something useful. Uh, but if we get caught, you two will be expelled too. Not if, we, not if I can help it, said Hermione grimly. Oh, not if I can help it, said Hermione grimly. Flitwick told me in, in secret that I got 112% on his, his exam. They're not throwing me out after that. 120%. Okay, Harry showing some uh, vavoom. Harry showing some vavoom and Hermione. Again, breaking away from the right thing to do for friendship and relationships. There we go. Oh, look at him. He's just a, he's a bundle of legs and fur. After dinner, the three of them sat nervously apart in the common room. Nobody bothered them. None of the Gryffindors had anything to say uh, to Harry anymore, after all. This was the first night he hadn't been upset by it. Hermione was skimming through all her notes, hoping to come across one of the, enchant the enchantments they were about to try and break. Harry and Ron didn't talk much. Both of them were thinking about what they were about to do. Slowly, the room emptied as people drifted off to bed. Better get the cloak, Ron muttered, as Lee Jordan finally left. Stretching and yawning, Harry ran upstairs to their dark dormitory. He pulled out the cloak, and then his eyes fell on the loot Hagrid had given him for Christmas. He pocketed it. He pocketed it. Pocketed it. <laughs> he pocketed it. He pocketed it. To use on Fluffy. 
He didn't feel much like singing. He ran back down to the common room. We better put the cloak on here and make sure it covers all three of us. If Filch spots one of our feet wandering on, on its own. Uh, what are you doing? Said a voice from the corner of the room. I don't know who that is. Let's find out. Neville appeared from behind an armchair, clutching Trevor the Toad, who looked as though he'd been making another bid for freedom. Neville, you cowardly clown, getting some courage? Triple C, that's some alliteration for you. <laughs> I just made that joke, and Mark did this. Apparently he didn't like it. Um... Nothing, Neville, nothing, said Harry hurriedly, putting the cloak behind his back. Neville stared at their guilty faces. You're going out again, he said. No, 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 said Hermione. No, we're not. Why don't you go to bed, Neville? <laughs> Harry looked at the grandfather clock by the door. They couldn't afford to waste any more time. Snape might even now be, pl uh, be playing Fluffy to sleep. You, you can't go out, said Neville. You'll be caught again. Gryffindor will be, even a, will be in even more trouble. You don't understand, said Harry. This is important. But Neville was clearly st stealing himself to do something desperate. I won't let you do it, he said, hurrying to stand in front of the portrait hole. I'll, I'll, I'll fight you. Neville, Ron exploded. Get away from that hole and don't be an idiot. Uh, don't, you, don't you call me an idiot, said Neville. I don't think you should be breaking any more rules. And you were the one who told me to stand up to people. Oh, wrong time, but good courage, buddy. Um, yes, but not to us, said Ron in ex ex exasperation. Neville, you don't know what you're doing. He took a step forward and Neville dropped Trevor the Toad, who leapt out of sight. Go on then, try and hit me, said Neville, raising his fist. I'm ready. <laughs> oh, Neville. Neville, you pure heart, you. Harry turned to, to Hermione. Do something, he said desperately. Hermione stepped forward. Neville, she said, I'm really, really sorry about this. She raised her wand. Petrificus totalus, she cried. Petrificus totalus, she cried, pointing at Neville. Neville's arms snapped to his sides. His legs, his legs sprang together, his whole body rigid. He, sweared, he, where, he swayed where he stood and then fell flat on his face, stiff as a board. Hermione ran to turn him over. Neville's jaws were jammed to get, jammed together so he couldn't speak. Only his eyes were moving, looking at them in her horror. I'm going to go for one more minute. What have you done to him? Harry whispered. It's the full body bind, said Hermione miserably. Oh, Neville, I'm so sorry. We had to, Neville. No time to explain, said Harry. You'll understand later, Neville, said Ron, as they stepped over him and pulled on the invisibility cloak. But leaving Neville lying motionless on the floor didn't feel like a very good omen. In their nervous states, every statue's shadow looked like filch. Every distant breath of wind sounded like peeves swooping down on them. At the foot of the first set of stairs, they spotted Mrs. Norris skulking near the top. Oh, let's just kick her, just this once, Ron whispered in Harry's ear, but Harry shook his head. As they climbed carefully around her, Mrs. Norris turned her lamp-like eyes on them, but didn't do anything. They didn't meet anyone else until they reached the staircase up to the third floor. Peeves was bobbing away, halfway up, loosening the carpet so, they, so that they would trip. Who's there? No. Who's there? He's, Who's there? He said suddenly as they climbed towards him. He narrowed his wicked black eyes. No, you're there, even if I can't see you. Are you ghouly or ghosty or wee student beastie? He r rose up in the air and floated there, squinting at them. Should call Filch, I should, if something's a creeping around unseen. Harry had a sudden idea. Peeves, he said in a hoarse whisper. The bloody Baron ha has his own reason for being invisible. Peeves almost fell out of the air in shock. He caught himself in time and hovered about a foot off the stairs. Uh, so sorry, your bloodlines, Mr. Baron, sir, he said greasily. My mistake, my mistake, I didn't see you. Of course I didn't, you're invisible. <laughs> Forgive old Peeves, see his little joke, sir. I have business here, Peeves. Oh, I have business here, Peeves, croaked Harry. Stay away from this place tonight. I will, sir. I most certainly will, said Peeves, rising up in the air. Hope your business goes well, Baron. I'll not bother you. And he scooted off. Gonna end it there. Wowsy, wowsy, wowsy. 
lot of stuff going on. Okay, um, again, th th a lot of nighttime shenanigans. Them taking uh, a lot of things they shouldn't be doing. Uh, I think that's number four. Number three or four nighttime trips in this book. And we're, on to, we're gonna finish off the book next time. We are going to finish the book. And I will continue on. I'm, uh, I'm invested now, I'm interested. I like the characters, I like the writing, I like JK rolling, rowling, and I like spending time with you. Okay, so uh, any questions, any thoughts? Any, oh yeah, he, he, I already got the second book here. These are all lent to me by Nathan, my good friend Nathan. Uh, okay, any questions, thoughts? How many more pages? We have 20, 21 more pages. You ended at the top of my next page. Yeah, I did. Yeah, about 20 or 21 more pages. Uh, before I forget, after this at 7.20 on Vancouver Theatre Sports, I'm going to be doing a little character interview. So if you're interested, tune in, tune in at Vancouver Theatre Sports at that time. Follow Mark at yoc.creations. Um, and yeah, now let's have some time. John, do you re realize there are six more books? I do. I do re realize that. And I'm going to be reading them regardless. So why don't I read them with you? I have an important question. Which word or words did you stop at? I stopped at the word, uh, and he scooted off. And he scooted off. I have 30 more pages. Well, your book is probably a bit, has uh, thicker writing then, probably. Uh, who do you think that is, tr that is trying to steal the Philosopher's Stone? It's Voldemort. It's Voldemort. He's the bad guy. Some of Nicole's jokes maybe yearn for the, for the of death. I don't know what that means. Um, and, uh, hey man, don't be mean. Thanks. And they only get longer. Yeah, I know. I've, I've seen the tomes, the thick tomes of the last books. They're going to be thick and a long read. What's your favorite accent? Um, I like trying the Scottish accent, even though I'm not spectacular at it. Uh, I'm okay with it, at it, but I think it's, it's really hard to do. It's a hard accent. And the Italian accent, I, I know it's not genuine. It's, I know it's not a genuine Italian accent, but it's fun to do. Uh, my book was invented for blind people. Oh, that's interesting. He's drunk, lol. No, I'm not. Find me by, find by me their shillaries. I don't know what that means. Do you like Italian people? I love them. I've been to Ita Italy the uh, last two years in the summer. And it is phenomenal. The people are great. Does Mark have the clippers handy? I'm not shaving your beard. <laughs> they want me to shave your beard. Oh, okay. No, that's not gonna happen. Uh, no, he hates them too. He's not an idiot. I do not hate Italian people. Have you ever heard an Italian accent? <laughs> yeah, yeah, I have. I'm just bad at it, that's all. I'm trying my best. <laughs> you love the Italian accent, but uh, Nathan is the worst person to, to speak about accents. You don't know anything. I have the last few books if you need to borrow. Thanks, Heather. Thank you very much. It's meant for blind people because the text looks almost all bold. Cool. That's awesome. Thought I might have to leave. I don't know why. Uh, I, I'm, I'm really enjoying this. I'm enjoying reading the books, but I'm also enjoying interacting with all of you. It's really fun. She's clueless and racist. Keep the beard. You're doing great. Thank you very much, everybody. I, I'm keeping the beard. Thank you. It's not going away regardless. <laughs> okay. Unless somebody has a... Any questions left over, I'm going to lag up. Come back tomorrow at 6 p.m. for the final part of the Philosopher's Stone with in Conk's Corner with John's Re John Reedley. John Reedsley. <laughs> Conk's Corner with John Reedsley. Uh, yeah, actually, yeah, you are Italian. That's true. <laughs> you let me how bad my accent is. <laughs> okay, friends, thank you so much. I will see you all tomorrow at 6. Uh, log on to Vancouver Theatre Sports at my time, 7.20. Right now it's uh, almost 7 for a little character interview. Uh, having a lot of fun with all of you. I'll see you tomorrow. Bye.